and we're back with the Hammer Podcast. That's right, Hammerheads. Today is a very, very special day. This is the 50th episode of the Hammer Podcast. Now, there is some sad news to some, happy news to others, but someone might have also turned 50 today. That's right. You heard it from me first. There's someone who, you know, there's so much weeping because it's going over the hill that we might not mention who it is, but someone might have turned 50 today. And let me just say, my voice doesn't sound like a 50-year-old. No, it doesn't. It might sound more like a 20-year-old. I want to tell you, this is, I don't feel over the hill. I feel like I've just, I'm at the pinnacle looking at it all. I'm, I'm halfway there. Halfway. Okay, hold I've on. I've still got another Is it another really halfway? Because, you know, 100, are you going to live to 100? Is that like a guarantee? So it makes I, Not 50? a guarantee, but in fact, I, I probably won't. I mean, you know, look, I was born in the United States. I'd like to die in the United States. And I got to tell you, I don't know. This country's got another 50 years. Whoa, so whoa. I'm what's not, with all the pessimism? You must not be a uh, post-millennialist. Yeah, well, well, sound now, very, you're, now you're getting ahead of us. Now you're getting ahead of us. Doesn't sound very victorious to me. That's, well, uh, you know. But yeah, that's right. So, you know, to all the hammerheads out there, we're celebrating 50 on 50 today. 50 on 50. Hey, I tell you, uh, Brad Rock's not looking too bad for 50. Woo! You know, I'll take it. That's right. And I just want you guys to know that this was orchestrated by our producer, Snurdly. He brought all of this into uh, fruition. That's right. 50 at 50. 50 at 50. Now, we're going to have to slow down a little bit if we're going to reach our 60th episode when I'm 60. Well, I no, no. The Hammerheads won't allow that. We can't slow the pace down. All right? that We'd have to slow it way we down we would. to make it 60 on 60. But all right. Well, good enough. So we, uh, we're going to turn to our topic at hand. And today we wanted to wrap up our theological discussion on the millennial views and how, and then based on our discussion about the millennial views, we then want to start heading towards where we were, you know, the intention all along is that what, right. what is that, what does that mean for the Christian in the public square and how really none of those views should have any impact on how the Christian should engage with the world around yeah, that's them. right so the post-millennialist amillennialist and pre-millennialist show up in the public square what should we be doing right well that's what we're going to talk about should there we be doing anything different based on which particular eschatological view we have yeah well that's where we want to ultimately and, get to and a lot of people want to act like there are differences dramatic yeah. differences yeah we're probably tipping our hands we don't think there should be but we'll hey talk hey, about hey that you when know, we you get gotta, there you gotta wait you got to, there's an anticipation. You don't That's know right. where it's going to go. So, but um, we had talked about discussing the Old Testament, interpreting the New Testament and how that plays into that. But we wanted to take things a little bit different direction. So could you explain that for us? Yeah, well, you know, as we were talking about it, we decided it's such a big topic. That is uh, how to interpret the Old Testament in general, prophecy in specific, and then also how is the Old Testament used in the New Testament. And that really kind of warrants its own series, so we'll be looking to do that, Lord willing, soon. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. That it really is a huge topic, um, and one that I think we'll be have a good time discussing. But today we wanted to touch on two key areas: the reign of Christ in each of the three primary millennial views, and then the more recent development in eschatology, most specifically the de- the developments that keeps inching the premillennialist and the amillennialist closer and closer together. Now, I know that sounds a little odd, but if you're just observing the, the modern developments of these things, it seems to be quite true. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna, it, it, I think it is true, and it's uh, instructive and helpful for us, to, so I'm looking forward to discussing it. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's talk about the reign of Christ in the pre post and Ah Mill. I think you wanted to start with with one with how one's view of God fits into all of this. Yeah, so before we even get to specifically how his reign is defined in the three primary millennial views, because I think that's really 
secondary to this, mm. but I never, I've never really heard anybody come at it from this angle. So I, you know, there might be some, some areas here where I need to rethink things or reword some things, but, uh, and I'm certainly welcome that, that feedback, but, uh, uh, but you know, we talk as we went through this, uh, a little bit about what I call emotional eschatology. <laughs> Stop being so mean. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Emotional. Get them some tissues, and and yeah. basically, I, I might even say some cheap shots at views other than the one you might hold to. So yeah. I, w- I want to kind of talk about that first. Yeah, it's crazy if you if you are on the, you know, the interwebs looking at these things. People are throwing cheap shots out all the time. So. Could you remind us of some of those examples? Well, sure. You know, a a post millennialist might say something like, you have an eschatology of defeat. I have an eschatology of optimism. (laughs) Premillennialism and amillennialism are eschatologies of defeat because you see the world getting worse. You know, or on the other side, someone might say post millennialism is absurd because it says the world is going to get better and be Christianized. And boy, I tell you, when I look around, when I turn on the news, which is another mistake, uh, <laughs> yes, but is. when I do that, I certainly don't see it getting better. Okay, well, I, we need to steer clear of that sort of attitude and thinking because look, the issue is what does the Bible say, right? Yeah, That's, that should be the only thing we care about. So if the Bible says the world will be Christianized, then who cares what it looks like now? Or if the Bible does teach that things will get worse before Christ returns, then why is that pessimistic? Yeah. yeah. So what we're concerned about, not about what's optimistic, what's pessimistic, uh, but what is biblical? Yeah, which I think is so important, and it's... It's so important for us just to say, look, we stand alone on the Word of God, yeah, period. Right. Um, and, you know, all these arguments, the cheap shots, the emotional eschatology, they seem to have nothing to do with Scripture and are just based purely on what people feel or think about something. So how does this, how does this come to play as we discuss the reign of Christ? All right, so having, once again said my bit about emotional eschatology. Uh, Let's talk about the reign of of Christ, all right? And and at times when you're discussing Christ's reign in the pre-mill, post-mill, and on-mill positions, you run into, you can easily run into this sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cheap shots more than anything is, I guess, what I would say. You you could have a a post-millennial say something like, uh, well, we're the only ones who actually believe Christ is powerful enough to reign in such a way that it brings victory through the gospel proclamation. Yeah, they're the only ones that believe in the power of the gospel. Right. They could say that. In fact, some have. You might have an amillennial say something like, well, when Christ reigns, there is no sin, and Christ's reign is spiritual. And that is much more glorious than your idea of any earthly reign. Yeah, see, the, that's more spiritual. Right. And Or, on the other hand, you might have a premillennialist say, I actually believe that Christ's reign on earth will reign on earth, on David's throne, and it is a much more glorious reign than what the postmillennialists or amillennialists teach. Right, so right. my point is simply we need to void all of that. Let's be more mature than that. Let's let's get beyond that. And let's just talk about what the Bible has to say. Right, exactly. So what you wanted to begin by talking about one's view on God. Right. So before we even get to the specific reigns, again, beliefs about Christ's reign in the three primary views, because I think that's very secondary to what I want to talk about now. So I want to begin by talking about Christ, by, by talking about our view of God and therefore his reign, okay? And, and I'm speaking here in the context of mature believers. Yeah, sure. If somebody just got saved yesterday and they're listening to this, they're going to hear, their head's going to be spinning, they're going to hear all sorts of things, they're not really going to know where maybe to begin. But I'm going to say, look, that whether one is post, pre, or amil, they can and should all have the same high view of God. And I believe they do. I'm talking about mature believers. Right, now. right, yeah, mature believers. Okay. Uh, I, I believe Jonathan Edwards, for instance, to name a post-millennialist. Good old Johnny boy. I think he had a high view of God. Now, I never had a discussion with him. Did you ever have a discussion with him? Well, in a seance a couple years ago, we brought his spirit back, but no, 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 I'm just kidding. Never. He's dead. All He's right, dead, you're, guys. You're Saul, huh? No, I, you know, <laughs> so, right, right. I think he had a high view of God. 
Yes. Uh, I think uh, Spurgeon, you know, historic premillennialist, he had a high view of God. I'm going to say I've never talked to him. Yeah. I think uh, dispensational premillennialist John MacArthur, I think he's a high view of God. Uh, I think Sproul was a post-millennialist. I think he had a high view of God, okay? I think Piper has a high view of God, another premillennialist. Uh, and then we can go down the list with uh, Anthony Hokima, mm-hmm. uh, Vern Poitras, uh, I mean, uh, Ligon Duncan. We, we just keep going. There are many amillennialists who have a high view of God. So, so what I'm saying is we, we all, as mature believers— should have the same high view of God, okay? So while we may articulate Christ's reign differently, especially uh, as pertains to the millennial period and our belief in the millennial period and the nature of it, all right, it's it's not that one view, you know, post, pre, amil, it's not as if one view makes his reign, uh, make him seem more powerful or more, or more majestic than the other view. All three have proponents, uh, and I trust even now there's some post, odd, pre-mill of, of every sort listening, and, and we all agree on a high view of God. So it's not an issue of, like, we're not here out, you know, fighting and, and, and pulling our knives out to see who's got the largest blade, see who's got the biggest, greatest view of God, all right? I think right. we all have the big biblical view of God. Now, that's good. That's good. Well, so let's talk about th- those views of God, yeah. his attributes, and the implication of the attributes. Most of the attributes, we all would say, yeah, amen, that's true. Right. How those okay. yeah. p- pertain to his reign. Yeah, so look, I'm excited about this. Look, now, to reign is something you do, right? To reign or to rule. Yeah, I mean, inherently, that's... Right, I mean, that, that's something you do. It's not something word. you are inherently. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, I'm going to try to explain something in a way that I've not heard anyone else do it, and that's dangerous, especially because I didn't really think about explaining it this way until early this morning. Hey, it's this is 50 so, on 50, baby. I, that's We're right. going so for it. 50 great. on 50. Amen. All right. So, look. Uh, and, and we're going live time here. So, look, if I, if I miss something... You know, if I'm violating Scripture, call me out, help me here. That's right. That's the hammerheads. Pick up the phone. (laughs) So look, here we go. For instance, we say of God's attribute, we say one of God's attributes is love, right? Or his perfections, attributes or perfections, whatever you prefer. Yes, yes. The culture says it's his only attribute. Yeah, right. Right. So one of his attributes is love. And by the way, all of God's attributes, he is equally all of his attributes. You can't say he's 80% love, only 10% wrath, right? He's equally all that he is. But So we say one of his attributes is love. And then we can also say God loves us, Mm -hmm. right? He loves us, and one of his attributes is love. God is gracious toward us, and one of his attributes is grace, right? And we could go on and on. So when we speak of God's attributes, this is who he is, right? It is inherently in his godness, right? in his essence. Yeah, right. It is who he is. Okay, now we don't speak in the same way with regard to God's reign or God's rule or his dominion, right? I mean, if you look up God's attributes, no matter what list you look up, you're not going to find reign, rule, or dominion listed as one of his attributes. Right. Right? However, you are going to find attributes like sovereignty, right? He's sovereign. You're going to find providence. You're going to find that he's omniscient, he's all-knowing, he's omnipotent, right? He, he's all-powerful. And we can keep going on and on, but... But these attributes, just take sovereignty, providence, omniscience, omnipotence for a second. These attributes mean that God is necessarily reigning, necessarily ruling. And they mean that he has dominion everywhere and at all times. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm saying that to be God, part of being God is that you are eternally reigning, ruling, and having dominion. Right, yeah. That there is never a time, never was a time, never could be a time when God was not or is not or shall not be the ultimate authority. Mm-hmm. In other words, before Genesis 1-1, God was the ultimate authority in eternity past, which is what we call the time frame before Genesis 1-1. 
he is the ultimate authority now. So he's the ultimate authority before Genesis 1-1, mm-hmm. before he created the universe. He's the ultimate authority now, and he shall be the ultimate authority in the eternal state. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thought. And you, you sit back and you look at it. If, he, if that's not true, then how is he even God? Because those attributes have no place to even, right. you know, work themselves out. And I mean, you know, let's think about it. All the hammerheads here, they're putting on their caps. They're excited for the 50 on 50. And I, I don't think any of them could Can disagree. Can we stop mentioning the 50 now? <laughs> I would like that. Can we stop that? It's a source. <laughs> it's a source subject. But, you know, I don't, I don't think the hammerheads <laughs> would disagree. Um, so as you say, when we're studying God's attributes or his perfections, you won't find words like reigning or ruling or dominion. Right. Yet, his attributes, you know, the, the natural and necessary implication of all of those attributes is that he rules and reigns without end. Right, eternally, always. Yeah, there's, there's, there can't, it can't right. exist without that. Right, I, I mean, what is the other alternative? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess someone or something else could be ruling or reigning, but then now, <laughs> now you're in blasphemy yeah, to say exactly. that. Exactly, exactly, okay. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So now, you know, as my mind's churning, someone might like to point out that uh, good old Satan, the deceiver of old, you know, it says that he's the prince Hmm. of the power of the air. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, and even there he's called what? A prince, not a king. Mm. That he's not a king. Yes, that's right. Jesus is king. He's not king. Uh, and any authority he has has been delegated by by God, right? Proverbs eight fifteen, right? God says, "By me, kings reign." Now that's talking about earthly kings. So whether it's earthly monarchs, kings, presidents, prime ministers, rulers, or Satan himself, any authority they have is delegated by God. Yeah, because he's the only absolute. Period. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, okay. So people's minds are churning again, and someone says, "Oh well, gotcha." What about the kenosis passage? Hmm, yeah. Philippians 2. Well, right, and, and there in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, what Jesus empties himself, right? The word empty, kenosis, okay? What, what, what he empties himself of is not any of his attributes, right? Jesus never ceased being fully God, never. Mm-hmm. Even when he was in uh, the, the little baby in the manger, right? When he's going to the cross, he never ceases being fully God. God can't cease being God. So then what did he empty himself of? Well, he emptied himself. You know, we have a hymn that says he emptied himself of all but love. Well, (laughs) that's otherwise a good hymn, but that is simply not accurate. Yes. What he emptied himself of was the independent use of his divine powers. In other words, he only used his divine powers when the Father willed that he do so. When he performed miracles, it was always when the Father willed Mm -hmm. that he do so. That is why the passage goes on to say he was obedient, right? Obedient even what? To 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 the point point of death death, on a cross. Yeah, that's right. That's good. So we can say that God cannot not reign. Yeah, that's a double negative, but it's a good one. That's a great double negative. Yeah, it's a theologically accurate one, right? God cannot not reign. Exactly. So... So then, when we speak of the reign of Christ in reference to the millennial views, pre, post, amil, yes, okay, we're merely speaking of aspects of his reign. Or we could perhaps say sub-reigns of Christ. Now, this is my own term, so I'm sure somebody will let me know. That's a good term. I like it, the sub-reigns. It, but, but what I mean by this is that he is always and ever reigning, just as we said. He can't not not reign. Right. So if one speaks of his reign in the church age... That's merely an aspect of his reign. It's not like he was not reigning before and won't reign after. Yeah, that's... Right? Yeah. And if a, if a premillennialist was to speak of a future thousand-year period where Jesus reigns on earth, it is merely an aspect of his continual eternal reign. Mm-hmm. A sub-reign of his eternal reign, we might say. Okay? Since God reigns eternally, it's not like we can say with an like we can with an earthly king, that today he begins his reign. Today he's, he's, is his coronation. We can say that with an earthly king, right? Or a president is sworn in or what mm-hmm. have you. But God has always reigned. Okay, but we can, from the human perspective, perceive that a particular aspect or sub-reign 
to use my term, begins or, or commences mm-hmm. uh, or maybe even ends uh, at a particular point in time. So what I'm driving at here is this. All mature believers should agree, whether you're pre, post, ah, or anywhere in between, all mature believers should agree that God is always reigning, and there is never a time when He is not the ultimate authority. Yeah, period. Right. Yeah. Therefore, when we begin, when, when we then begin to speak of different aspects of God's reign, different time periods of His reign, we should do so with this view of God, that He is always and ever reigning. He reigns eternally. Now, if we understand this, then we just when if we understand this, then when we discuss the nature of Christ's millennial reign, uh, we we need not act like one view is higher or more glorifying to God than the other, because we all agree He eternally reigns, right, and has all of the authority, always for all time, right? Yeah, past, present, and future. No, that's good. Okay, well, so you know we're seeing all of that, but of course. You know, some might be thinking about how, well, how does all this work with the Godhead and with the subordination? You know, the the Father always reigns, but does Jesus always reign in the same way as the Father? Yeah, well, and this gets into the whole, right, uh, subordination of the Godhead, right, the fact the that Christ, right, um, the fact that Jesus always is in, you know, subordinate to the father does mm-hmm. exactly according to his plan all that okay and and i'm not really you know that's a whole nother series that we could do which would be good and i'm not really trying to get into all of that here uh i'm just i'm just going to kind of focus more on the oneness of god in terms of of the issue of of reigning here right jesus is lord of lords king of kings never a time when he was not or is not king of kings lord of lords yeah no, I think that's good. It, it might be a good thing for us to, to dive into later. So, yeah, sure. Well, that's a long introduction, um, but I think it was helpful uh, to our specific... That was only the introduction? <laughs> that's right. That's buckle in, friends, buckle in. We're just about to begin. But yeah, as our, our long, helpful introduction. Yeah, well... And as I say, I've never heard anyone explain it in this way, but I don't think we've said anything that that is not biblical. Again, we can spell out a whole lot more this whole thing of, well, what about God the Father reigning and and then Jesus reigning under him or this or that, right? And then when I mean you can have those nuances, but and look, I'm sure somebody else has said said it much more eloquently than what I've just laid it out, but uh, but I hope I've been understandable. Uh, I, I hope it has has made sense. Uh, and, and and look, we we just have to sit back for a second and praise God and say, "Wow, yeah. this, this is this is the God we serve." Now, look, this is on the forefront of my mind too because I've got a sermon this Sunday. If the Lord tarries, or if I make it, you know, I'm an old man now. Uh, we might <laughs> we, have to we might have to have a plat, you know, get rid of the steps going up to the. Uh, we're gonna uh, have to get an elevator, a little yeah, lift for the steps, a little lift to get, to get or some up. diapers. Maybe we'll buy All some right, diapers. That's oh. now, now we're going. <laughs> All right, we've digressed. Yeah, but so it is. Let me it's steer a wonderful. The ship back around. Yeah, it's a wonderful I, thought. To well, take, we've God got reigns. the all in all this Sunday, where he Jesus pans the kingdom over, and God may be all in all. So it's just to me. I mean, it's just amazing when we think of His reign and who God is. And I mean, and then when we discuss it, we we will never ever in our discussion, we will never be. They're just we don't have vocabulary enough. To praise God enough, that there aren't enough superlatives. Yeah, there's not enough pins for us to say. You know, yeah, to write yeah, it it's down. It's just incredible. Now it is. It's it truly is amazing. Um, but all right, well, Snurdly's telling me here that uh, it's time for our our sponsor. So let me remind the the Hammerheads that this sponsor, this episode, has been sponsored by the Truth. You can't keep it hidden. You cannot keep it hidden. So. You know, as we as we continue on, uh, it almost seems a bit anticlimactic to look at God's reign according to the millennial views, but let's dive in specifically to, you know, how that parses itself out. Yeah, yeah, and it is kind of a bit anticlimactic, and and that really was 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 my whole point in in that, in one sense, it doesn't really matter 
with the post-millennialist, amillennialist, or pre-millennialist, their particular view of Christ's reign mm -hmm. in the millennium, because it's just a, a sub-reign. Right? Right. I mean, it's just an aspect of his eternal reign. Uh, so so I'll, I'll, I'll be brief um, on this, but again, when discussing the nature of Christ's reign, uh, we, we need to remember that we all, as mature believers, have this big view of God. We know he reigns eternally, so it's not like Mr. Postmillennialist, Mrs. Premillennialist, Mrs. Amillennialist, Mr. Amillennialist, whatever. Why is the premillennialist going to be a Mrs.? Yeah, I I'm knew a... as soon as I said it, I said somebody's going to say it's cause this. It's because it's a girl view. Premillennialism is for girls only. Oh, really? <laughs> That's because they right. read, you know. Somebody all right. cut his mic. All right, look. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the point, right, is, is that we, we all... Not not one is high, is, presents a higher view of Christ or a more powerful Christ than than the other. Okay, so uh, I mean, you, you know, you can go through uh, church history, and and uh, and you will see whether it's a millennial, post millennial, uh, even pre millennial to an extent. Of course, obviously, pre millennialism is going to say that. The millennial reign uh, is primarily in those thousand years. You know, mm -hmm. back at the beginning when we started talking about all this, remember I said there are uh, there would be some, you know, like myself, where I say there's an aspect of the kingdom facet right now. Right. Okay. Um, so in addition to, I believe, the Revelation 20 kingdom shall come. Uh, so anyway, but particularly with... Postmillennialists and amillennialists. If you look throughout church history, uh, and, and you said, "Let me look and just see what they say about the reign of Christ in the millennium," you will have. We, we wouldn't have enough time to talk about all the different nuances that people throughout church history, amillennialist and postmillennialist, uh, all the different nuances and the ways they've explained uh, Christ's reign. You know during during the millennial time, and of course, both of those views would see the millennium as now mm -hmm. uh, between Christ's first and, and second coming, uh, and and so forth. So, uh, so it becomes, you know, so it kind of gets difficult to, you know, to go through all of that. But, uh, but again, when we talk about his reign, we need to remember. Uh, you, there, there are different effects, right, uh, of his rule. I mean, think about it. God is totally sovereign, always reigning. We said that, right? But he allowed sin from Adam, and he allows sin all the way to the end uh, yeah, of exactly. this age. Uh, that doesn't mean his reign is lessened any, mm -hmm. or that it mars his reign. He allowed it. He allows Satan to have some delegated power, as we said, over the world. And I think sometimes our minds think that God is only truly reigning if there's no sin and everything is perfect. Hmm. But again, he must always reign. He reigns eternally. And in that reign, in that rule, he sees fit to allow certain things at certain times. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a helpful thought, right, as we think through that. So specifically with regard to Christ's millennial reign, it, you were saying that that is just an aspect of, of this overarching eternal reign that has ever that's always and ever will exist. Yeah. Yeah, and which I said earlier, you know, sub reign, right? It's it's like a reign with within his reign, so to speak. So so if someone says that Christ is exercising a millennial reign right now and the result of it will be that things get better in the world and he returns, i.e. post millennialism, I say, "Okay. I don't agree with that particular view, but I don't find it to be heretical mm -hmm. in terms of the rain. I said, that's fine. Uh, so, you know, now I would have a problem if that person says, well, my view of Christ's reign is better than the other views because it demonstrates Christ's power better uh, because things on earth are Christianized. Mm -hmm. You know, with that, I would have a problem because, again, God rules eternally. And, for instance, when <laughs> sin entered the world, it did not diminish God's rule or character or anything at all right. because he planned it all. Orchestrated, right. Right. Now, back to the millennial reigns. If an amillennialist were to say that Christ's millennial reign is occurring now, and it is spiritual in nature, and Christ will return and then reign forever in the new heavens and new earth, I have no problem with the nature of such a reign with Christ. I say, okay, great. I, no heresy there. Now, I might disagree that we're in the millennium now, and I do. 
Uh, but I have no problem with this view of the reign of Christ. However, notice that even in this, we see what I would call the aspects of Christ's reign, right? The, the amillennialists will say Christ reigns now spiritually, but then he shall reign in the new heaven and the new earth. Mm-hmm. So like we've established before, Christ always reigns. He reigns eternally. So what we're really looking at, what we're really talking about are manifestations of his overall eternal reign. Yeah, the sub reigns, the aspects right. of it. Right, now... Let me turn to a premillennialist, right? Let's say a premillennialist says Christ shall return and then reign on the earth for a thousand years. Okay, I, I don't have a problem with that so long as it is recognized that that is merely a facet of his reign. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes people, particularly premillennialists, talk as if the millennial kingdom is like the, this is what we've all been writing for, this is what everything the history is boiling up to, and this is the ultimate consummation. And that's not true. The ultimate consummation uh, is new heavens, new earth, the eternal state. Right. Um, so at any rate, um, but, I, you know, again, he, he's always fully reigning. He's God. Yeah. So, okay. In some respects, what you covered today about God reigning eternally is is that that really almost, I, I don't know about it, but the wording, you know, I'm going to use it, it's almost makes an explanation of Christ's millennial reign less important. I mean, if mm. if we all agree that part of being God is that he reigns eternally, then it makes the nuances within the millennial views of Christ's reign mm, less of that, less of a big deal. Yes, yes. Uh, and, 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 and one point I wanted to stress... What was not to be, and I think I've stressed it enough today, but but do not be one of those people I mentioned before who says things like, well, post-mill, pre-mill, on-mill person, you know, has a weak view of Christ's reign, and my particular view displays a more powerful, more glorious Christ. And my concern is there are a lot, and I don't even, I guess I will use the age thing. Uh, it's appropriate for today, but... I see a yes, lot of very, a lot of younger guys, today. right? First of all, I'm just going to go out and say you cannot be you can you can be 25 or 30 years old and have a millennial view, but you cannot be anywhere near sure of your millennial view at 25 or 30. I mean, I remember at 25, I thought I knew more than I know now at 50, but I've had now 25 more years, right, to read, study, preach, and really preaching through Scripture. Uh, you know, is the biggest difference. Because it's one thing to read books and read even theology books, and you constantly read about a p- certain system, and the same verses are constantly mm-hmm. brought up, right? When you preach through God's Word, book by book, verse by verse, in different venues, different times, uh, and then as you're preaching, you're also reading through God's Word in your right. own devotional time and all that, all of a sudden you begin to see things that you didn't see, verses that aren't covered in the theology book. Or whatever, you know, and you begin to look and say, oh, and and by the time you're done, you realize that there's no really man-made system of theology that holds up, you know, all the way, lining up with Scripture. So I'm just saying we want to make sure we're not one of those people uh, that thinks somehow our view has a, you know, bigger God, and then so then we kind of stick our heads up and and really what we—it's a pride. It's a pride thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. And uh, and and frankly, I'm speaking more recently of the growing. Uh, there's a trend, and I'm kind of, you know, starting to really rub me wrong. If you can't tell, newer, newer, younger post millennialists saying things like, "I have an optimistic eschatology. In my eschatology, the gospel prevails." You know, I abhor this juvenile rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. It would be like a gnostic running around saying, "I have a more optimistic optimistic view of sin." You're not actually a sinner. Nothing you do in the body matters. So really, sin does not matter. (laughs) I mean, can you imagine that? It's crazy. Or or as I've said before, it would be like a universalist running around saying, my view of the gospel is even stronger and more glorious than the post-millennialist because in my view of the gospel, the gospel saves everyone. Mm. It's powerful enough to save everyone, right? Uh, This stuff I find very irritating. And look, the fact that everyone is not saved, the fact that things are not holy in the world right now is not a result of the gospel's lack of power any more than the fact of sin coming into the world was a demonstration of God's lack of power or oversight. Yeah. Oh yeah. Amen. Right. It's, it's all part of God's plan. So, so 
we must stick to the Bible alone. I mean, you're trying to sell a car. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's, you know, hey, my view's this, my view's that, you know, again, this whole emotional stuff. What does the word of God say? Right. It's the only thing that lasts forever. Right. Right. The what, word what of does God the is word perfect. of God say? That is all we should care about. Let our let our arguments come from Scripture alone. Yeah, no, amen. All right, well, look, Snurdly's giving me the cue, which means that we uh, don't have time to get to our second point about the pre-mill and ah-mill getting inching closer and closer together. So I guess we're going to have to save that for next time. But as we make the turn, it's now mm. our favorite part of the episode. That's right, the Inquisition. The Inquisition. So as the Grand Inquisitor, I will turn into the vault. Oh, 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 whoa, okay, all right. Oh, here we go. I got it. Okay, I've got a... Hold on, hold on. I bet I can guess the question. Oh, you think you can guess it? Yes, I bet this question is something like, how can you feel and look so young and vibrant at 50? I thought we weren't going to bring up age again. Well, now in, a you... posi- in a positive way, that's a good thing. But the way you're looking, I didn't guess the question right. <laughs> the question is uh, not that quite. Been the question. Not quite about your age, Brad Rock. But um, in honor of your fiftieth, we do have an inquisition that actually is. Um, someone must have been listening to the briefing because they're saying here they were listening to Al on the briefing, and he was talking about the. The totalitarianism that's being seen. Hold on, which owl are they listening to? The good owl, conservative owl, our <laughs> friend owl, or the other owl? Well, it's hard to tell. There's some shape okay. shifting that happens sometimes. Uh, well, give me on the, the question, briefing. and I'll let you know which owl they were listening to. Yeah, okay, so he's Al was talking about the totalitarianism mm. that is being seen unfold before us in Hong Kong, which it's an interesting. Oh yeah, sorry, that's the good owl. Yeah. yeah. Which really, it's been the good owl for a while now, you know. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, that you know, best behavior. But uh, okay, yeah. It, but and then so then. the totalitarianism seen in Hong Kong, as compared to mm, the alleged yeah. totalitarianism of, I think he said the Orange Man Bad. <laughs> I think yes. most of our hammerheads should know who the Orange Man Bad is, but if you don't, you know the alleged totalitarianism of yes the Don. That's right. Well. Yeah, first of all, a lot of people probably don't know, and we're going to give the whole rundown here. You know, we do have missionaries that we specifically do support in Hong Kong who, of course, need to remain nameless for their own uh, well-being and protection. But uh, in a- in essence, uh, they just passed some stuff through in Hong Kong that essentially makes them a, a vassal puppet uh, of China. and The CCP? Uh, yes. And... And, you know, China's been trying to do this for a long time. And interestingly, there really wasn't a whole lot of uproar this time. But, you know, they kind of did it from within. They got their hands into the leaders there, kind of set their own leaders up there to pass through legislation and so forth. Uh, even to the point now where it's kind of like any anyone that is seen saying anything against, um, you know, the CCP or... If they're, if, if they're seen as uh, speaking to, corroborating with other nations, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they can be arrested. Uh, they can be, uh, you know, thrown in prison, even perhaps uh, killed. So and, and, and basically it's, it's so open ended that it's going to be like what's happening in China right now with, where, where the CCP, they, they can drum up any charge right. and apply this. To anything, show trial. I think is and, what we call it, a show trial. Right, and and that's totalitarianism. That that's not what what, what we saw with the the former president. Um, certainly was not that. In fact, you know, with, with politics, you have to look at what usually what people are saying. Um, at least with the media, that's exactly what their side is actually doing, right? Yeah, they're, they're yeah. the ones that. Uh, it's, it's the liberal side that wants to take away First Amendment, the freedom of speech, and um, and bring in draconian measures and, and things like that. 
Um, and that's, you know, and I think one of the things that people don't realize because, you know, they say, yeah, we can't be political. Don't be political in the pulpit and all this stuff, right? Is that, okay, if I were to talk to believers and say, hey, do you believe, I believe the most important thing, the one thing that's going to change hearts is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I think all of our listeners, I think anybody who's a true believer, right, would say, yes, I agree. Okay, now, you can't say that on the one hand, and then say, I don't care about politics or anything on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Because to say that, there's a disconnect because I, I, what we should be saying is, hey, we want, and we know God's in control, but we want and we pray for, we should be praying, uh, we want and we pray for freedom, not just in this nation, but all around the world for the gospel to be proclaimed. Right, so they can advance right. without hindrance. So... Hong Kong today, what it is today versus a year from now and five years from now for Christians, just just wait and see. Mm -hmm. And and you'll see. It, they're not going to have the freedom to proclaim the gospel like they did uh, and that sort of thing. Now, yes, God's still going to build His church. Okay. Um but I'm just simply saying that for somebody to say, I, yes, I believe the gospel is the real answer, but I don't care anything about politics. Well, wait a minute. I, I'm always going to, like here in the United States, we get to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, I mean, they even vote in Russia. In fact, <laughs> shockingly, yeah. shockingly, Vlad won. In fact, I heard he got over 80% of the vote. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah, they take lots yeah, of votes in other that's, countries. That's, that's amazing. But at any rate, you know, we, we vote here, right? And and when I vote, one of the first questions I'm always at, yes, there's the abortion issue, which I've always said is obviously the issue, right? Yes, yeah. But uh, th this one's linked to it, and they're always going to be on the same side. Find me somebody that is against abortion uh, and for life, against murdering of babies, and I will find you somebody that's going to be for freedom of religion, mm -hmm. and allowing the gospel to be proclaimed, right? So I'm always looking for, hey, which which, which candidate, okay, because Jesus isn't running. Yep. So which which candidate uh, is, is, is there likely to be, from everything we can tell about them, to be the most freedom to proclaim Christ? And that's who I'm going to go with. And that's always going to be, by the way, again, the same one that's for the life of... Yeah. The Protecting child the conceived the in the womb. Yeah, that's All right. right. So, uh, so to say that you know it's totally separate. So, but but people here certainly should wake up because we we see this and any idea. This would be a whole other podcast that we can talk about this. But you know, sometimes people say, "Well, look at the Book of Acts. the The word spread, the church spread, even though there was hard times." Yeah, and yeah. The yada, martyr yada. complex. So that's therefore, what I like to call so, yeah. It. So therefore, we should want harder times. Yeah. Look, yes, there's a context to acts and and yes the gospel spreads and it spreads even today in difficult times that doesn't mean we should pray for difficult i think those people should just move to china or nigeria just just move to another country yeah, move to the parts of the middle east and because you're fa under their own reasoning their faith should thrive right yeah yeah under that in I, fact they should yeah just go to another country and go preach the word and get thrown in jail and you should be happy because you be, should be thriving yeah. and sanctified like never before, right? So there's some some faulty logic there, I think, involved there. Uh, but, we, we, yeah, we definitely need to wake up uh, and, and understand uh, what's going on in Hong Kong and, uh, and, and even what could be at stake in this nation. And it should help us not to—we don't get—we're not afraid. Jesus is reigning. We, we talked about That's that, right. right? Yes, Jesus reigns, reigns eternally. However, we should be aware of these things, and we certainly should be praying. Mm-hmm. Uh, for God to give us grace, give us mercy, and not give us what we deserve as a nation and as individuals. Yeah, right? amen. I never, I have never prayed and said, "God, give me what I deserve." That's I don't. If, if that was the case, I wouldn't have made fifty. That's not what I want. That's right. I want, want grace, mercy, and we ought to be praying for that. So now that's good. All right, all right, all right. I got Snurdly's buzzing in. There's yeah, someone. There's oh, someone at the door. It's. Yeah, it's okay. The nursing home has come oh, to take. Funny. All right, this is a. This is <laughs> All right, we'll see. Somebody it. cut his mic. <laughs> In 168 hours. <laughs> <laughs>